turn to Daniel. This is our fifth lesson in the book of Daniel. On um, the vision he had <clears throat> about the 70 years of captivity. <clears throat> Verse 24, we're looking at 24 through 27. 70 weeks, which we know are years, <clears throat> we've discussed that. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says 77s <clears throat> have been decreed for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the holy place. So, <clears throat> 77s would be 490. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore, this is the first seven of sevens. To know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild, rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, notice that's capital P, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks it will be built again with plasma moats, even in times of distress. <clears throat> that would cover Ezra and Nehemiah. After 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. That's crucifixion and have nothing. And the people of the prince, that's going to be the fourth kingdom. That would be Rome in history. And the prince who is to come will come out of the revived a dictator, dictator of the revived Roman Empire. He will be the Antichrist. <clears throat> we have discussed that. Is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary that was in 70 AD, the people of the prince, which was Roman. <clears throat> and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make the Antichrist, the prince of the people, the Rome, the dictator of the revived Roman Empire. He will make a firm covenant with the many Jews for one week, which is, of course, we know to be seven years. That's called the tribulation. He will put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings and on the wing of abomination, which is called by the, is called by the name abomination of desolation, will come one who makes a desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out and one who makes desolation. That is the stone, if you recall, of prophecy, which is Christ. That will be second coming. Okay? We're going to talk about all that today. This, uh, again, is our fifth study. If you dropped in on this study today, you'll be behind four weeks so but for those who are on internet if you dropped in on this study you need to go back because we'll be flying way past you <laughs> so let me encourage you to go back and pick up some previous studies there are five of them related to this we are now uh, past explaining all this we are now trying to move forward you'll recall that during his uh, Bible study of, of Jeremiah, probably 25, of Jeremiah, and he was going over the captivity because it had had to be getting close to time uh, of it. Here I go again. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to leave that right there. No, I better leave it right here. Um he was studying uh, Jeremiah, which was his pastor in the from the homeland, sending in Bible studies. Uh, he, he studied that, that there would be 70 years of the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Babylon. And when, uh, give me a moment. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be one of those nights where I'm just going to sneeze all night, apparently. Um, by the time we get into the ninth chapter of Daniel, 
Babylon has been conquered by the Medo-Persians. And so he's under a whole other rule now. And so he is really curious about what is, what's going to happen now. I've been through, when this 70 years is over, it went to Babylon. Now we're under uh, Medo-Persians. Uh, now what? And so uh, he goes into this great prayer, the ninth chapter. He goes into this great prayer about this, this intercessory prayer for the people. And he goes through uh, all the things that Jeremiah recommended him to discuss with God as an intercessor prayer for Israel. And it's a great intercessor prayer for Israel. Before he gets through, if you recall, Gabriel, one of the top, top dog angels, shows up. Uh, and Gabriel is, is the messianic teacher. When he, when he shows up, he, I mean, this is big stuff, Messiah big stuff. Um, next to Jesus himself showing up and teaching. I mean, so Daniel shows up and, and he explains the vision that had been given to Daniel that Daniel was praying about and trying to, expl trying to figure it all out. He comes in and explains it. And when he does, wow. I mean, sometimes watch out for what you pray for. Right? I mean, we've heard that. But he's just, I mean, he's looking for a snapshot picture about Israel in the 70, and God took, takes it from the Babylonian captivity all the way to the millennial kingdom. I mean, that's as far as you can talk about Israel. He took his, <laughs> I mean, here's a guy in the 6th century that's just trying to figure out how do we get from today to tomorrow, and God gives him the panoramic view. Think how fortunate we are. Why don't we study the Bible more? We sit in the, the best position to, to know it all. I mean, what he told Daniel is just so far out there. Listen, and we've just lived through most of it. We're only waiting. Listen, there's three sections to it, the first seven, and then the 62, and then the one, right? To make 70, you got seven, 62, and one to make 70. We have outlived all the history of the 69. We're waiting on the, 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 last, the one last seven called the tribulation. I mean, and so we're going to explain all that hopefully over the next few, few weeks. I'm about to have prayer. My guy's not here to remind me, but I... He's put it in my head enough to remind myself. So what Gabriel gave him was a breakdown of the history of Israel from the Babylonian captivity to the millennial age. And he did it by, by 70 times 7. And then he broke it down. He said there's a 7 times 7, there's a 62 times 7, and there's a 1 by 7. See, that's how you get there. 70 Sevens is what they said. So let's have a word of prayer and maybe I can get rid of whatever is going on in my nose. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people who have a desire to live a spiritual life. It's all about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, both in the inspiration of the Bible and the inspiration of your soul into your learning, into your living. I mean, it's just a... But you can't learn the Bible. You can't, you can't learn it. You can't live it in carnality. You have to be a spiritual person. You do that by confessing your sins. You live in the privileged age of priesthood, 1 Peter 2. Every believer priest has the privilege to confess your own sins, take care of your own issues because Christ has made it possible for you. Oh, my goodness. So, Father, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're so thankful for that. We should be more appreciative in our souls for the grace that's been provided for us just to confess sin. 
because all the work was done to give us the privilege. It is the privilege of sanctification in the Christian's life. And so, we're so thankful. We pray tonight the Holy Spirit will minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. We're told that when truth is taken and cycled in our souls by faith, it frees us. Frees us from the cosmic system of lies. Gives us clarity. Uh, God is able to give us clarity tonight just like he gave it to Daniel in the 6th century. So we pray for that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me talk about a few things. First is just point number one is a review. So let's take a look at the review. There's a brief, a, a brief history of Daniel's three sections of seven. You got the seven sevens, you get 62 sevens, and then, you know, as far as multiplication, and then you got the one seven. Okay? <clears throat> and we've laid it out on the top of your paper for you to see. Now, when you break it down into a historical look, just a panoramic view, the first seven, the first seven and the end of the fifth cycle that Babylon started and now is in the hands of the Medo-Persians, we're told in the 25th verse of chapter 9 of Daniel, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince. And so the seven and the 62. Now the 62 is going to come into play with the seven <clears throat> because it says then after. It means the seven weeks. See in Daniel 25, he says <clears throat> there will be seven weeks for the Messiah, there will be seven weeks and 62, that makes 69. It says, then after 62, meaning the seven and 62, after, then after the 62, which, which is actually 69, right? Yes. Six, 69 years of, of ideas there. The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. That's the crucifixion. It's going to come in Daniel's 69th, what, what, what is called in the English Bible, the 69th week. Okay? But we, we understand we're not talking about weeks. Now, between 69 and 7, there is what we call a gap, a historical gap. See that? After the cross, between 69 and 70, there is a historical gap. In that gap, here's what we know from history. We know we have the mystery of the church age, the, the incarnation and the mystery of the church. We have the fifth cycle of Judah to Rome in 70 AD. And then the rapture. All of that has got to occur. Now, most of it has. We're living in the mystery of the church age. The 70 AD has already happened. And now we just wait for the rapture of the church for, the, for us and then the seven years. I mean, that's how close we are to the end of this whole kit and caboodle. We do, and we do, you know, live in the last days of human history. I mean, the next is going to be the, the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, which in the Old Testament, they did not know there was a first and second. They just referred to it as the coming of Christ because they didn't understand the mystery of the church. With the mystery of the church, we have a first coming and second coming. So the church talks all about the second coming, the second coming, right? I mean, because we know the history of the first. I mean, we, we have lived in our period of the, that. So everybody is geared up to the second coming of Christ. And that's why it's a very, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, pastors really have to be careful that they don't become preoccupied with, with eschatology, the preaching of the second coming, because it has such an interest to people in the church age that you can lose the practical part of your life, right? <clears throat> and and uh, I know myself, as, as I began to learn, I had to really measure myself because I was just, everybody was so curious, everybody wanted to know, and um, you, and you can spend a lot of time teaching on it. I mean, you can spend a whole lot of time. Well, the fifth cycle by Rome in 70 AD is discussed in the ninth chapter 26 when he says, and the people, which you know in the second chapter and the fourth chapter 
uh, the second chapter and the seventh chapter of Daniel talks about the fourth kingdom. You know, there are four kingdoms that are going to control. And the fourth kingdom is Rome. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And so he says, and the people, which would be the Romans, uh, of the prince who is to come, which is the Antichrist, he, he is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And they did that in 70 A.D. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war de desolations and, and determined. So what we look for now is, this, is the 70th week of tribulation. When you study it, according to Daniel, according to Daniel, and that's going to be, once Daniel gets this and pushes it out, it's going to become common, common theology that the seven years of the tribulation are divided in three parts. There's going to be the first three and a half, the middle, and the last three and a half. Now, I wanted you to see this in verse 27 on your paper. And he, the prince, which is the Antichrist, which is the dictator of the revived Roman Empire, will make a firm covenant with many, that is Jewish, for one week, that is seven years. But in the middle of the week of seven years, so we have a three and a half middle and a three and a half to make seven. In the middle, he will put a stop, break covenant, See, he will break covenant. See, he's, he's made a firm covenant. Now he's going to break it. He's going to break the covenant to sacrifice and grain offerings. And on the wing of abomination, which is just prior to him stat putting his statue up in the temple to worship him as God, which is called the abomination of desolation. That's Matthew 24, 15, where it's called the abomination of desolation. Well, let's just look at that. Hold your place. Well, I don't suppose you really have to. Oh, that's all right, Pam. It's uh, just stuff falling. <laughs> if it don't fall out of the sky, we'll be all right. If it falls out of the sky, then worry about it. If it falls off my podium, don't. Ma Matthew 24, 15. Uh, you're you're f probably very familiar with this verse, whether you're familiar with the whole thing or not. 24, 15. Um, 15. Now, do you have a study Bible? Uh huh. Okay, in your uh, in your um, references, at verse fifteen, you should see Daniel nine twenty seven. Agreed. Yes. That's where this comes from. Okay, verse fifteen. Therefore, when you see abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And then he goes on to describe some stuff. That's not in Daniel, but he goes on to describe it. You see? And, and who is he speaking to? Israel, Matthew 24. Okay. So that's important. And, a good, and, and listen, uh, even, even Jesus, you know, read, it's, it's in red letters, right? Yeah, in red letters. Um, he refers to Daniel. I mean... J Daniel is a very important book to Jesus right now as he is, as he is now headed towards the crucifixion. Who talks about that with very glaring terms? And it's a very important point, isn't it? When, when, when the Messiah comes and when he's crucified, when he's cut off, see, and Jesus is all over this, right? Okay, just... 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 is another passage for you. Uh, on the wing of uh, abomination will come one who makes desolation even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on one who makes desolation. And he's referring, if you recall, we discussed uh, Daniel 2, 35 and 45. You remember that messianic rock, that messianic stone that would come and crush that's what that's about, and that's Christ and His second coming. And, and that would be, in the reality of what's going to happen, would be a Revelation 19. That would what that would be. Now, the Great Tribulation. Notice down there on your paper, the Great tri tri Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is referred to in two terms. G the Great Tribulation is used as understanding the seven years of tribulation, there's the, the, 
next week I'm going to talk about, I'm going to dis discuss with you the, the three great judgments that are going to be revealed from uh, Revelation 6 ni through 19. We're going to talk about the seals, we're going to talk about the trumpets, and we're going to talk about um, the bowls. And I'm going to tell you, they're, they're overwhelming. What's going to happen is overwhelming on the earth. Um, but the seven years is called the Great Tribulation, like in Matthew. It's called the Great Tribulation, but listen, technically, the Great, there's the great Tribulation is the last three and a half years. So, in some references, they'll talk about the Great Tribulation. We're talking about the last seven years, right? In specific, though, you want to pay attention, we're talking about the last seven years, which starts when, like Matthew says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, listen, that's, gonna, that's in the middle, and that's going to kick off the last three and a half years. And, whoa. In fact, it's a whoa, whoa, whoa in Revelation. It, it is going to smoke. I mean, boy, what God throws upon the earth is going to be amazing. So, in some passages, the Great Tribulation refers to the seven years, and sometimes it refers to the last three and a half. Okay? Um, let, me show, let me show you. Uh, have you still got Matthew? Matthew 24, 15, 16. I want to show you two words. These two words are really important. I'm going to, in verse 15 and 16, 15 and 16, now pay attention with me. See in verse 15 the word when? All right, now look in verse 16. See the word then? Now, therefore, of course, tells you, anytime you see the word therefore in the English, it means why for? <laughs> so it, you always have to pay attention to what the background of this statement is, but the word when, when you see abomination of the desolation, then, then, and then he starts a series let those, in verse 16, let him, verse 18, let him, woe to those. See what I mean? It's the when then. When, when you see the abomination of desolation, then it's going to really blow apart. You understand? Now you're going to have the last three and a half years of judgment, and they're going to be something. All right, so, oh, I wrote that out for you. I have spoiled you people so bad. I have, okay. All right. Uh, in, in Matthew, since we're in Matthew, let's see, 24, 24, 21. Then, so we got a win, then, then. Are you with me? A win, then, then. All right. For then... There will be a great tribulation. Now watch this. That, now we're in the last three and a half years. Such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Whew. The last three and a half years called the great tribulation. Jesus said, there is no way in human history to compare what's going to happen in three and a half years. There is no way. To, you, you, there is no historical reference even close to telling you how bad it's going to be. How about that? I mean, we've had a lot of bad things in history. He said, there are none to compare. Right? I mean, I'm not making that up, am I? No, okay. No. Here's Revelation 7.14 at the bottom of your paper. These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the martyrs. 
of the tribulation, the martyrs of the tribulation, are, are absolutely heroes to God. The martyrs, the, the, the believers that have gone through these seven years, even when we call the first three and a half years peace, whoa. It's, but listen, we're familiar with people talking about peace and there is none, right? There's the, America has lived in relevant peace compared to the rest of the world. We, you know, you talk about the hedge of God around a nation. It has been us. And you know why? Because the church has taken responsibility, the church has taken responsibility to keep America being the light to the world, America, being a light to America that's a light to the world, salt to America that's been a salt of the world. And God has put a hedge around us. We have, we have honored, we're not anti-Semitic as a nation. A a and the church must always be out front. We have a clear gospel. And can I tell you, it is the South that must never waver. We are it, people. We are it. All you have to do is travel to the other parts of the, of the United States, go from border to border, and it is the, the heart of America is in the middle of America. Listen. It is where agriculture feeds America and the world. It is where the church feeds America and the world. We are it. And I don't mean just the South. I'm talking about Midwest and that. I'm talking about that, that center of America. The center of America is what keeps America functional. The East and West, they're always sliding somewhere. We are the heart. We are the heart of it agricultural, economical, religious, educational. We're the heart of it. Oh, I know you know that. We should pray that that stays. I mean, it's, it's enough for God to keep everything else collective. That's what's kept the hedge around it, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. It's not worth any more than an opinion, but it is mine. Here's the second thing. There are certain phrases that describe Daniel's 70 week or the tribulation described by different terms in the Bible. Many of these that you're familiar with, I thought I would just pull them down and collect them for you. For example, it's called the great tribulation in Matthew, as we read Matthew 24, 21, the great tribulation such has not occurred since the beginning of the world. Uh, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble because it involves the nation of Israel. Not, not two tribes, 12. Right? Jacob's trouble. It's called Jacob's trouble. You know where the 12 tribes came from? Jacob. Jacob's trouble. Right? We got 10 tribes out there that are going to show up. <laughs> and they're going to show up like you might imagine either. We'll talk about that next week. You got 12 tribes, you ought to read how they're, you know, the 144,000? You know, 12,000 out of 12 tribes, right? You ought to read how the tribes are. You want, you want an interesting study? Take a look at those 12 tribes. I, I, it, I bet they're not what you think they are. Well, maybe you are. I don't know. Depends, depends on where you've been studying. Anyhow, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you've heard the phrase time and times and a half a time. That's, that's your three and a half year principle. That's Daniel 7.25, 12.7, Revelation 12.14. How about 42 months? Right? 42 months. Revelation 12.2, Remember when you're, now a month is a month. But listen, when you're talking when you're talking Old Testament, you're talking about a 30-day month, a 360-day year. So don't forget that when you do math in the Old Testament. Because people make a big mistake by not understanding they're under the lunar 
system. Uh, in Revelation 11, 3 and 12, 6, they talk about 1,260 days. Just remember when you count that, you're talking about a 30-day month. Uh, times of distress in Daniel 12, 1. See, Jesus picked that up in Matthew 24, 21. It says, times of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation. Jesus took it further and said, since the world began. Um, it's called the time of Gentiles. In Luke 21, 24, Romans 11, 11 through 15, 25 through 28, and Revelation 11, 2. These are all worth your study, but I'm just showing you. You're probably familiar with some of these phrases. You've heard them connected with this study. I just showed you there is a there's quite a collection of them, all saying the same thing, just saying it a different way. Point number three. Hey, John? I'm at point number three. That's because I sneezed two times. <laughs> Daniel's 70th week, and the Lord kept me on track. Daniel's 70th week of tribulation is divided in three sections of study. There's the first three and a half years, the middle, and the last three and a half years. So what I, what I want to do is kind of give you a, a panoramic view. Now, next week, I'm going to go in. We'll study this a lot in big detail. I'm just kind of giving you the three and a half, because you're going to have to study the seals, the bowls, and the the trumpets and the bowls to get this. So, because they're not going to say, well, here's the first three and a half years and lay it out and then the middle and lay it out and then the last three. So I just kind of gave you a panoramic view of how this thing is going to roll. And next week I'll get in specifics. We'll get into... Bam. So what I'm, what I'm going to do, there, there's more, but I just thought I would pick five highlights of each one, Okay just to give you an idea. Next week, when we come in, when we study all this stuff, then we'll, we'll, we'll connect the dots, okay? Because you can't do it any other way. You have to, I mean, the Revelation from 6 to 19 is about seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. <laughs> they don't explain it by three and a half years, middle and three and a half. But since that was the way it was laid out in Daniel, I thought I'd give you at least five little ideas of each one. For example, in the first three and a half years, there are seven seals. That's not... Okay, this is... Okay, seven seals. And two whales, no. Seven seals... In the first three and a half years, you're going to have seven seals and the first four trumpet judgments. You're going to have temple worship revived by unbelief. You're going to have 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Pay attention to the tribes. Don't think you know them. There's 12, but don't think you know them. Okay. If you're going to go, if you're going to look at the 140, look at the 12 tribes, look how many is going to come and forget that. Then start looking at who the tribes are because you're going to be amazed. Okay. I'm telling you. All right. Then you got two dictators are going to arise. You got the, the dictator of revived Roman Empire and you got the dictator of Palestine. That's called the false prophet. Okay. You got two dictators. You have world peace disguised, disguising the rise of satanic power, the Antichrist. World peace used as a cover so they can build, build their forces up. I mean, we do know that, don't we? Peace, 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 and all the time they're rattling the sword behind the scene. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shows you how dumb this guy in North Korea is. I mean, nobody fights that way. Trump's got it right. I don't tell anybody what I'm going to do. I just pop them. I mean, that's warfare. I mean, you always talk peace while you're building your army. I mean, everybody does that. I mean, all the conquering nations, 
Babylon. You think they went out and started conquering the world before they had an army? They didn't do it with talk. But anyhow, I hope we're not afraid of that dummy over there. Middle of the tribulation, here are five highlights. There's an alliance, and this is really big deal. There's an alliance. The, remember, uh, Daniel and the prophet said they, confer, they, they firmed a covenant up. There's an alliance between the dictator, the revived Roman Empire. You remember what this is when you, when you study the fourth, when you go to Daniel. Now, pay attention. When you go to Daniel, the second chapter, the seventh chapter, pay attention to the fourth kingdom. That's Rome. The fourth kingdom is Rome. And you're going to have the little horn and the toes and all that business. This is really, really big stuff. I mean, you got ten toes. Tell the, the, it, that's the ten federations and all that stuff. It's all Roman. Um, you're going to have an alliance between these two. And, 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 and we call it, the theology calls it the unholy trinity because it's Satan, the dictator of the Roman Empire, the revised Roman Empire, and and the dictator of Palestine. And it's called the unholy trinity. And boy, are they three going to get it. Listen to me. In the end, in the, at the end of chapter 19, at the end of chapter 19, I'm talking about Revelation. At the end of Revelation, He's going to, listen, after he comes back and puts a whammy on everybody, when the Lord comes back and puts a whammy on it all, right? He's going to take the dictator of the Roman Empire and the dictator of Palestine, called the false prophet, he's going to cast him in the lake of fire. He's going to take Satan and put him in the abyss for a thousand years. That's the stone that crushes. That's pretty amazing. That's my, listen, that's my Savior in a whole new light, isn't it? A warrior come back to judge. First time he came for sin, the second time he comes for judgment, right? Boy, is that powerful. They come back and just put a whooping on everybody. Put a whooping on them, boy. Anyhow, there's this alliance. During this middle, there's a war in heaven, and Satan's excommunicated. Told you, uh, uh, you know, Michael. Yes. Listen, the first whipping he got was at the cross. Jesus put a serious whipping on him. That's that's why he used everybody. I mean, he, he had two disciples. One was was a dummy, and he used him. You know, Peter, get behind me, right? And then, and then he got Judas is scared. He had him set up all the way. And uh, and listen, listen to me. Here's what Jesus did for us. He died on that cross for our sin and death, was buried and raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of God the Father with all authority, which he has put us under. And today, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Are you kidding me? How did that happen? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, third member of the Holy Spirit, took up residence in my body. My body became the temple of God and a champion of champions because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Uh, all Satan is is a big, a big bully blow-off. He ain't got no teeth. He's got no teeth. He's got no teeth. All he does is bark bark and bite has got no teeth. All he does is run around and he threatens everybody. He's got no power. He has no power over us except what we give him. Don't do it, Peter. Don't do it, Judas. <laughs> well, anyhow, there's a war in heaven. Michael's going to give him the second whipping. Going to excommunicate him. There's worldwide anti-Semitism campaign is launched when these two guys firm up their allegiance. They go right after them. There's the abomination of desolation. Now you know. I mean, show you how stupid Satan is. Don't you know when you get him to set that up, you're on short time? 
You've just run to the end of your lease, uh, leash. Maybe lease through, I don't know. And then the mark of the beast is going to occur during this part of time. This is where it's going to be instituted. Middle of the week. Middle of the week. You got three and a half years in the middle of the week. Well, that's, a, that's some kind of middle of the week. <laughs> That's some kind of middle of the week. Then three more after it. That's some more kind of big stuff. The last three and a half years of the tribulation, you're going to have the trumpets five through seven. You're going to have the seven bowls. We'll, we'll break all this down next week for you. Next week, pro, pro, John will probably be right about how far we get. Um, per, that's a pretty amazing thing when you look at this. Great persecution and martyrdom of believers. Those who didn't get the beat, listen, those who didn't get the mark got the sword. And God gave them honor. Boy, you talk about an attitude that God has for the unbeliever and the attitude that he has for the believer that, saw, that stands tall for him in the midst of the worst persecution. Worse than any, if you, if you combined all of history's persecution, nothing would be like the last three and a half years. <clears throat> and boy, he takes great pride in that believer that didn't take the mark and took the sword. And you're going to, when you read Revelation, he talks all about those who, who stayed with the blood of the Lamb, those who never compromised the blood of the Lamb, shed their blood for the blood of the Lamb. <sighs> and I'll tell you, God will salute them. Listen, God will salute them every time he meets them in the, in the glory. He will salute them. You can see it when you read Revelation. I'm going to tell you, when God meets one of these martyrs that came out of there, he's going to pop them one right like that every time he sees them in the, in the... That's what he thinks about them. Oh, they're going to go like, oh, God, you're the great... He said, no, let me tell you, you're the one that deserves the honor. You deserve the honor. I salute you. That's, you read about what he thinks about the martyrs that came out of the tribulation, buddy. You go like, whoa. Battle of Armageddon, probably the most famous, isn't it? You hear more preaching on that probably than anything. Battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ, is what we call it. The dictator of the revived Roman Empire, the dictator of Palestine, going to be thrown in the lake of fire and Satan's going to be thrown in the abyss. What a glorious day. Boy, sing, angels. Sing. Choir, sing. Next week, we're going to take a look at the divine judgments. We're going to look at the seven seals. You can read ahead. We're going to look at the seven trumpets. We're going to look at the seven bowls, which is the story of Revelation 6 through 19. And we'll take a look at that. Then when we get through with that, we're going to take special, we're going to do special studies on eschatology dealing with all of this. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some very important issues along the way with it before we uh, leave the book of Daniel. Okay? Daniel got all this. And, you know, John is getting all these visions like, like him, and, and, and he's got the book of Daniel to prop up and go like, okay, this is what that is. And he lays his book out in Revelation out of a vision like Daniel to lay this thing out. Daniel got it in parts, and, and John just laid the parts in place. That's amazing. That's just, isn't God wonderful? And listen. So what should I walk away with tonight? Listen, this God that's got a hold of history has got a hold of yours. He's got your history. You know, he said, well, that's good. God did all this for other people, but I know he probably wouldn't do it for me. Are you kidding me? You're his child. You've been bought with, listen, you've been bought with the price of the blood of his son. Of course he loves you. Of course he's got your history. He's got everybody's history. He's got history, history. Of course he cares about you. He hasn't left you forsaken you. He cares about you. He cares about you more than all this stuff, you know. In, in sense of history, you're the now history. 
we just talking about history that's going to come. But listen, it's your history he's concerned with today. How are you doing? How are you doing? That's what he's concerned with. How are you doing? How are you doing? Let's have a word of prayer. For those who have come with us as a group by automobile as well as those by the internet, we encourage you to understand that God is in control of history, human history, biblical history, human race history. in the believer's life as it relates to the plan of God. I mean, he cares about your history, your personal history, as much as any history that you could ever read. You need to engage in him in it. He loves you. He wants the very best for your life. You need to know what that is. You need to... You need to be like Daniel who did what was normal in his life. He prayed every day, studied the Bible every day, exercised faith in his life. And God revealed enormous things to his life, both personal and future. Just like you, he's done with your life today. He's told you there's some things that are important to your personal life, in your personal life to the history of the life of divine viewpoint history. Wow, Father. We're so thankful for this. We pray, Father, that those who have attended this study would pay attention to the importance of God engaged in history. I mean, his history is going to run the way God wants it. But listen, in our personal history, we need to be on top of the game. You know, Father, we, we study to learn your will so that we can apply it to our life and find confidence. Consider it all joy. Or as the King James says, count it all joy. Every day we should be able to do that because God's in control. We're not in control. The only times I've found in my life when I don't count it all joy is when I think I should be in control and it's not gone the way I expected it. When I've left it to you, it's always gone according to your will. It's always gone according to the plan of joy. Count it all joy. Can we do that? We're told to do it. To have that attitude. And how do we get that joy? Oh, wow. I mean, it's a supernatural gift given by the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit. Joy. Whatever we're counting, we can have it supernaturally applied to it. No matter what we're counting, count it, count it, count it, count it all you want. But have joy. Have joy. Don't focus on what you're counting. Focus on what gives you joy. What you're counting is not where the joy is. Joy is in what God provides for you. And he's provided you the joy. He's even provided you the joy. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.